So I'm going to read the partitioning for several Linux distributions. I'll start with MX Linux, then I'll read the partition guide for Debian, Ubuntu, Manjaro, Arc, Gentoo, and LFS. So this may be long, but um, all these, most of these distributions have good documentation, and uh, it's most of it's at least. You can share it, and I'm certainly going to reference them. It is a pain reading through documentation. Part of the idea of this is to make that easier, and I'll try and set up maybe chapters in this video for the different um, distributions. I will start with MX Linux, but I, it must come with a statement. MX Linux looks like it is derived from Antix, which has a single maintainer, Anti Capitalista, which he clearly is highly political personally. Um, so, and th this happens, MX Linux happens to be on, uh, if you go to DistroWatch and you look at the list that they have on DistroWatch. MX Linux is number one. I like the fact that MX Linux is, um, it has persistent storage and antics and that it can be run live. That's very nicely done. And I did see on their forum that there were several moderators. So it appears like there are several people helping Anti Capitalista, um, several talented people over there. Nonetheless, um, it's maintained by, uh, you know, a very small group of people, it looks like. And I'm not sure I would consider that as a number one distribution. It is certainly for its live persistence. Very nice. And Antix does, the way they put it together, runs very nicely on um, low resource sim uh, systems. All right, their guide for MX Linux is roughly 200 pages. That's some nice documentation. Most of these videos are run with the Dolphin. I'm pretty sure he's a contributor. So um, there, there does seem to be more people than just anti-capitalista there. In any case, um, let's read on the installation process for MX Linux. To begin, boot to the live medium, then click on the installer icon in the upper left corner. If the icon's missing, click F4 and enter minstall um, pkexec, um, um, root password on live medium, colon root. In any case, you'll get the installer screen home the right side of the installer will present user choices as the installation proceeds. The left side provides clarification of the content. Okay, we're going to get to um, partitions soon. Keyboard settings permits changing the keyboard. Okay, comments. You um, Installer set to use existing partitions. Use disk. If unsure which is the partition you want, Use the names you see in Gparted. The disk you select will be examined cursorily for reliability by Smart. Uh, there's a link to that self-monitoring analysis and reporting technology. If problems are detected, you will see a warning screen. You will need to decide whether to accept that risk and continue. Select another disk or terminate the installation. For more information, click Application Menu, System, GSmart Control, and Perform Tests on the drive. Figure 217, Smart Warning of Risk of Failure. Uh, that's just a picture of that. All right, anyway, auto install using entire disk. Now, that's not what I'm looking for. Um, so I'm not going to read that. 
Modify partitions. Most users have concluded that it is better. So in this video, I'm reading on multiple partitions. If you're doing a single partition, I don't see a point to really study um, very hard on uh, <laughs> using multiple partitions. All right, modify partitions. Most users have concluded that it is better to carry out any such modifications before you start installation to avoid any problems. For instance, newly created partitions may not show up in the drop-down menus. If you select this, the next step will use Gparted to make and size partitions. Or if you have already created partitions on the chosen disk, these will be displayed. Okay, so that's Gparted. Encrypt. Full disk encryption is available for the first time with MX-19. I think they're on a higher edition of MX now. Comments. If you choose auto install using entire disk, you'll not see this screen. All right, choose partitions. Specify the root and swap partitions you want to use. If you set up a separate partition for your home directory, specify it here. Otherwise, leave um, forward slash home set to root. Note that the user's home folder will be inside the same root partition where MX is being installed. Many users prefer to locate their home directory in a different partition. Now this says that, that, but they mean then that of forward slash root so that any problem with or even total replacement of the installation partition will leave all the user's individual settings untouched. Unless you are using encryption or know what you are doing, leave boot set to root. Well, I'd like to know what I'm doing, so that's part of why we're reading this. Now, preferences. Check preserve data in forward slash home. If you are doing an upgrade, and already have data in an existing home partition, this option is not generally recommended because of the risk that old configurations will not match the new installation, but can be useful in specific situations, e.g. repairing an installation. Select Check for Bad Blocks if you want to do a scan for physical defects on the hard drive during formatting. This is recommended for users with older drives. You can change the label of the partition where you want to install, e.g. to MX-19 testing installation. Finally, you can optionally select the type of file system you want to use on the hard drive. Now the default is EXT4 and the ext4 is recommended in MX Linux if you have no particular choice. You can fine tune your encryption cipher settings with the advanced encryption settings button or just keep the defaults. Okay, so here they have a f uh, picture <clears throat> of the installer asking about the boot method. Let's make this bigger. Maybe you can see that better. Comments. While the main Linux OS is being copied to hard drive, you can click the Next button to fill in some additional configuration information. Figure 218 shows the Grub bootloader installation options. So let's see. 218. That's the, it says installer setting up an encryption. 219 is the installer looking for partition choice. Okay, and where we are at. Now, most average users will accept the defaults here. Well, I don't want to be an average user, which will install the bootloader into the very beginning of the disk. 
This is the usual location and will cause no harm. When you click Next, a pop-up message will check to see that you accept the location of the bootloader Grub. Installing Grub can take a few minutes in some situations. Note that the partition shown, SDA, that's the typical labeling that Linux uses, is just an example. Your particular selection of partition may well differ. Um, many users choose, uh, let's see, computer network setup. Okay, so let me pause this. Okay, now let's go to um, Debian next. So Debian uh, partition. Disk partitioning, that's a Wikipedia link, is the creation of one or more storage regions called partitions so that each region can be managed separately. It is typically the first step of preparing a newly installed disk. Okay, so if you build a computer and install a new disk drive, uh, the first step will be to partition that drive before any file system is created. The disk stores the information about the partition's locations and sizes in an area known as the partition table that the operating system reads before any other part of the disk. Each partition then appears to the operating system as a distinct logical disk that uses part of the actual disk. A Debian manual 9.5 data storage tips. Um, oh, down here it has disk partition configuration. Although FDisk has been considered standard, standard, parted deserves some attention. Disk partitioning data, partition table, partition map, and disk label are all synonyms. Older PCs use the classic master boot record, MBR scheme, to hold disk partitioning data in the first center, sector, i.e. LBA sector. Recent PCs with UEFI, Unified Extensible Firmware Inter Interface, including Intel-based Macs, use GUID partition table GPT scheme to hold disk partitioning data not in the first sector. Although FDisk has been standard for the, for the disk partitioning tool, Parted is replacing it. Um, they list of disk partition management packages here. All right, I'm, I'm not going to continue reading that unless I use that specifically. Um, okay, the disk stores the information about the part of uh, uh, next tools. The following software allows working on disk partitions. GNOME Disk Utility. Manage and configure disk drives and media. Gparted. GNOME Partition Editor, Parted, Command Line Disk Partition manip Manipulator, FDisk, Collection of Command Line Partitioning Utilities. Definitions, Primary Partition, a disk can have up to four primary partitions. It cannot have more than four due to limitations of the disk primary partition table. To get around this limitation, an extended partition may be used. Extended partition, a special primary partition that is subdivided into logical partitions. There can be no more than one extended partition on a disk. Logical partition, a partition residing on an extended partition. All right, partition naming. So the format is forward slash dev 
forward slash SDA and then a number. Okay, for number one is the first primary partition. SDA2 is the second. SDA3 is the third. Here they list SDA4 as the extended partition. SDA5 as the first logical partition. SDA6 as the second logical partition, etc. So your four primary partitions are SDA1 to 4. The extended partition goes on SDA4. And then SDA5 and above, the logical partitions go on the extended partition. So in this example, forward slash dev forward slash SDA4 is the extended partition. All the logical partitions reside on an extended partition. Let me pause it. All right, there may be a little noise in the background. Uh, let me just warn you. LVM, if you're not sure what size to make your partitions, using a small EXT3 forward slash boot partition and LVM2 base partitions for the rest can be a good idea. The advantage of LVM is that it makes resizing more practical. In the Debian installer partition manager, each logical volume is treated as if it were a disk in which you make partitions. I assign a single partition per logical volume. Then when I want to increase the size of a partition, I U-mount the donor and recipient partitions, resize, shrink the donor partition, resize, shrink the donor logical volume, resize, grow the recipient logical volume, resize, grow the recipient partition, and finally remount. This may sound the same as with E2FS resize on regular partitions, but it is not. EXT2 or 3 partition cannot be moved, so you can only gain space by shrinking the preceding partition, deleting the partition to grow, and recreating it larger, or by removing the following partition, increasing the size of the current partition, and recreating the following partition. With LVM2, the space comes from whatever logical volume you choose to shrink. LVM handles the details of where on the disk the partition blocks actually are. After, now you don't need to see my face to make this more interesting, right? I don't need to put up a video of me. After partitioning, after partitioning, the partition numbers of the unaltered partitions may change. For example, a partition that used to be identified as dev SDA7 may change to dev SDA6 after the deletion of a partition. In this case, a number of configuration files needs to be edited. Okay, so if you're partitioning, he says here you remove something, alter something. Um, configuration files may need to be edited. He says here the fstab file needs to be altered so that the swap partition and the various static mount points will work properly. Okay, so the fstab. Two, if the partition number for the swap partition was altered, the etc. initra m, wait, etc. in initramfs dash tools, config.d, resume, file also needs to be edited. Okay, good, he gave the address to get there. Although, what's the address for the fstab file? Um, also needs to be added. This, that's in the etc. folder, in the initra mfs tools folder. This file need, indicates the partition used for hi hibernation. Oh, okay. The, 
partition used for hiberna hibernation. The swap, I, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a separate partition for hibernation? Just thinking. The swap partition is generally used for this purpose. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. Update dash intra MFS dash U needs to be ran afterwards to update the intra MFS image. Okay, I guess that dash U flag is for update. Um, disk partitioning, disk full, FDIS, software RAID, partition identifiers. Okay, I think that concludes the Debian section of this. Now we're going to go to the Ubuntu section, and that's going to be pretty long, I think. Uh, it looks like they have nice documentation, which is one reason that Ubuntu is one of the better starting distros, or has been. If, if you had a partition, if you were running Windows and would like to install Ubuntu on your system, you must free up some space on your hard drive. See how to resize Windows partitions. Or install another hard drive on which to install Ubuntu. Now my plan here is to read stuff related to a brand new hard drive. Thinking of people building their own computer or adding a drive to their computer. Changing the layout of a hard drive is called partitioning. There are, uh, and there's um, a link to that. There are various partitioning schemes. Um, I'll probably take a look at some of that. That can be used to divide a hard drive. For most people, it would be sufficient to use one of the guided install selections during installation of Ubuntu. I think the guided install puts it all on one drive, if I remember correctly. This page was edit, last edited in 2010. Um, let's see. However, there are some circumstances in which manually partitioning your hard drive will be necessary. That's what I'm thinking of. This guide will give you basic understanding a basic understanding of manually partitioning your hard drive in preparation for Linux installation, as well as manipulating your partitions after it is installed. Now, I don't see partitioning schemes on this list, so I'm going to go to that in a little bit. And I'll probably look at the partitioning page, too. The Ubuntu's installer's partition editor as well as the commonly used gparted partition manager are some of the safest ways to par partition a hard disk. However, it is nevertheless important to back up important files before using them. In addition, removing unnecessary files and defragmenting a hard drive is worthwhile before manipulating partitions. In the interest of gaining free space and reducing the time necessary for the partitioning operations. All right, partitioning. Um, why use multiple partitions? When an operating system loads from its own partition, it always runs the fastest. When other alternatives are used, such as running one operating system within another operating system, like using a virtual machine, it's always slower due to higher RAM and hard drive requirements. Bootloaders, such as Grub, can be used to choose which operating system to load when each operating system occupies its own partition. The main reason to use separate partitions is for ease of maintenance. When an operating system occupies its own partition, it can easily be updated without affecting other operating systems or data that might be stored in other partitions. This is especially useful when certain applications are able to be used by multiple operating systems. A groupware application, such as Colab, for example, can be placed in its own partition and be used by whichever operating system is booted, 
it can stay consistent and independent. Even when one or more operating systems update themselves, it can then be updated independently of any particular operating system update and in fact be excluded from automatic updates by certain operating systems. The Linux file system can use a separate mount point for any directory, even if the directory exists in its own partition. Here are some examples of directories that are often given their own mount points, often in their own partitions. 1. Swap. Swap partitions allow you to use some of your hard drive space's RAM. Swap prevents your computer from crashing when you run out of RAM space and additionally allows the RAM to be used efficiently. Forward slash home. Now, I notice there's no forward slash in, in front of swap here. The forward slash home mount point is where individual user settings are stored. By placing this directory in its own partition, they can be shared between multiple operating systems and remain constant even when each operating system is updated. So that sounds like a good idea to have a separate home directory. Slash boot. The slash boot mount point is where the grub bootloader files needed to boot an operating system are stored. Grub2 can also be used to allow multiple operating systems to boot. Having a dedicated slash boot partition can make it easier to run and maintain multiple operating systems. Okay, so I know I'm going to have at least three separate ones, I think. Arguments against partitioning. Data loss is less frequent with current operating systems. If you believe this one, I have a bridge to sell you. A ah, little humor in the Ubuntu guide here. Two, the need to run multiple boot systems is mitigated due to the advent of virtualization and virtual... Oh, so he's going to rebut these. Um, um, so virtual systems. He says, it's not. I've tried it. It runs very slowly and all but the most powerful computers with lots of RAM. And uh, think of it, it's going to use up some of your RAM, right? All right, three, partitioning to create swap space is unnecessary, blah, blah, blah. Um, RAM may be cheap, but not all computer motherboards can expand their RAM capabilities and therefore still need swap. Further, Linux systems require more RAM these days, not less. Also, it's not the operating system that requires plenty of memory. It's the programs that run within the operating system that requires memory. All right, choosing a file system for a data partition. If you need a universally writable drive so that Win, Mac, and Nix operating systems can share files, consider these issues. NTFS is a consideration, but it is proprietary. And Windows' peculiar usage of these drives means Linux doesn't quite work perfectly with it. Further, Microsoft has the capability, and sometimes does, remotely lock NTFS folders. Do you want to take that chance that your NTF folder was remotely locked? <laughs> FAT32 was historically a good choice, but its size limitation, 32 gigabyte max, oh, that's why it's FAT32, makes it quite small for, to for today's standards. Three, the XFAT file system has no size limitation, but is not commonly used. Oh, there's other resources like PsychoCaps partitioning, disk space, and how to partition. But let's go back to the heart, how to partition. I believe that was partitioning. Now uh, let's do partition schemes. Uh, is this different? 
Most PC operating systems still work with an ancient disk partition scheme that historically makes distinction between primary and extended partitions. It also places a limitation of 4-4, like we read a little while ago, primary partitions or three primary partitions and one extended partition, which we read a little while ago. When present, an extended partition can then be divided into any number, uh, this number is written twice here, to, into any number of logical partitions. However, many recent, since 2011, machines use a different and incompatible scheme known as GPT, which allows many more primary partitions. Search these pages for UEFI to learn how to tell which scheme your system is using. Applying techniques for one scheme to a system that uses the other will definitely lead to possibly serious problems. Now, they talk about each Windows installation will need to be installed on a primary partition, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not using Windows at all. Windows systems commonly assign a drive letter to each individual Windows partition. Linux operating systems need a minimum of one partition, one for the OS itself and data files, and optionally one for a swap area to be used in, as an extension for RAM memory, if, pref if preferred over a swap file. While these two partitions can be primary partitions, more flexibility is afforded when logical partitions within the extended partition are used. So the two partitions they're saying here, um, for the operating system itself and for the swap area, um, logical partitions uh, are used for more flexibility. In this manner, as many partitions can be created as desired. Multiple Ubuntu, Linux, and Mac operating systems can be installed, each in its own partition, and data can also be more easily com compartmentalized when it is placed within individually within individually separate logical partitions. The swap partition can also be located on a logical partition. Use gparted to create managed partitions. The easiest way to do this is to use the gparted live CD as a partition manager or the gpart ed utility on the Ubuntu live CD. Examples, uh, you know, the fact that it's saying CD makes this sound older, as we usually use USBs. This is dating to 2014. Basic partitioning scheme for a two terabyte desktop HDD. Primary partition, one gigabyte of free space for bootstrap files, bootloaders, and stuff. Now it says y'all may need to think they have not corrected this to you may need in all this time makes me feel like nobody's read this to run multiple operating systems. Extended part or nobody's bothered to correct it. This says you may need should say you the LL should be removed. All right. Primary partition one gigabyte extended partition 10 gigabytes. That's 10 to 40 megabytes. That's for swap. 0.5% on in a two terabyte drive is not much. And 10 gigabytes is double the memory size of a typical four gigabyte system. See, that's another thing. I would say today the minimum for a system should be about eight gigabytes. So um, chew on that. Um, the extended partition, so they, they recommend here um, literally like eight years ago for a 
10 gigabyte swap, a 30 gigabyte root um, forward slash. For that, I think they just use the forward slash for the root. Um, for Ubuntu system files and applications. And three, a 100 gigabyte, that's 102,400 megabytes for your forward slash home folder. So swap, forward slash, and forward slash home. 10 gigabyte swap, 30 gigabyte root, 100 gigabyte forward slash home. On the home is the system application dependent config data, and other files. Three, 1,850 gigabytes free for another operating system, your system independent media files, virtual machines, and stuff. See, that's what I want to move to, a system independent uh, set of files. Because I plan on working on playing around with Arch and Gentoo and Linux from scratch and all these other systems that help you learn Linux better. All right, partitioning scheme for multiple systems. Um, no, I'm not reading that. Partitioning scheme for SSD. Better leave all read-only files on SSD and use hard disk for everything else. Okay. Um, HTTPS wiki debian.org read-only root. Should clarify which parts of the file system tree can be read-only. Moving the forward slash user to read-only would be the most significant thing. Greatest space required. I guess, but you have to ensure it is remounted as required when doing app-get install or remove. See that page for um, more info. Um, this is going to be a marathon reading, so I'm going to pause it every once in a while for a break. All right, I'm going to keep on reading at least until my hibiscus tea is done. All right, let's go uh, how to partition. So let's go to partitioning basics. When you buy a new hard drive, it usually comes in an unformatted state. There are no partitions or file systems on it, and it is ready for partitioning and formatting. It usually comes with a disk with a formatting tool on it which will create one or more partitions on this hard drive based on Microsoft's FAT file system. But partition creation and formatting can be done with any partitioning tool. Though there are certain issues when dealing with Windows on multi-boot systems. Uh, yeah, so I would totally leave Windows and any Anybody who interferes with my using Linux, I am totally done with the people that are not cooperating. <laughs> uh, for a while, it didn't look like Intel was going to cooperate either. All right. Anyway, um, there are certain issues when dealing with now uh, with using Linux partition tools like Gparted to modify Windows partitions. Upon launching Gpart Ed from the Ubuntu Live CD, select System Administration Partition Editor from the launch bar at top. And if necessary, selecting the hard drive, the drive will look like this. Forward slash dev, forward slash SDA, G parted. Um, okay, so when you first go into G parted, I guess it's going to read unallocated and the size of your drive. Notice that the entire drive is marked unallocated and is called free space. The drive is ready to create partitions on. I will start with the types of partitions that can be created and their purposes. 
Drives which have already been partitioned and formatted will follow these conventions. So in order to successfully and efficiently repartition them requires knowledge of these conventions. There are three types of partitions with which you will be dealing. Primary, extended, and logical partitions. What year is this? All right, 2018. Now we're only four years old. Hopefully later on, some of these other Linux distributions will be more current. <coughs> Pardon me. Partitioning conventions. In partitioning basics, I mentioned the unallocated free space on a new drive. All partitions created in this free space are created under primary partition rules and conventions. Primary partition rules and conventions. You can only create four primary partitions on any single physical hard drive. This partition limit extends to the Linux swap partition as well as for any operating system installation or extra special purpose partitions, such as a separate root, home, boot, and so on, that you might want to create. So you notice I didn't say etc. because there's an actual partition called that. If you attempt to create more than four primary partitions, you will see the following warning. It's not possible. <laughs> Notice that when I tried to create a fifth partition, gparted gave me a message warning that this could not be accomplished. How do we circumvent this limitation and create more partitions with an extended partition? Extended partitions. While in most circumstances, such as a guided install from the live CD on a new Windows computer, four partitions are enough. There are circumstances in which you might need to create more than four partitions. This is the reason for an extended partition. An extended partition is a special type of partition that contains free space, in which more than the four primary partitions can be created. Partitions created within the extended partition are called logical partitions. And any number of logical partitions can be created within an extended partition. The following conventions apply to extended partitions. One, an extended parti partition is a special type of partition that contains free space, in which more than the four primary partitions can be created. Partitions created within the extended partition are called logical partitions. And any number of logical partitions can be created. I hear my hibiscus tea back there, but that's fine. Any number of, since this is a marathon reading, people, you'll just have to put up with a few noises in the background sometimes. I don't have some studio, you know. I'm literally in my dining room with my computer. Okay, and any number of logical partitions can be created within an extended partition. The following conventions apply to extended partitions. Number one. When you create an extended partition, it occupies one of the four primary partition spots. When an extended partition exists on a hard drive, only three primary partitions may coexist within it. What, let me read that. You create an extended partition, occupies one of them. Extended partition exists on a hard drive. Three primary partitions may coexist. All right. See primary partition rules and conventions. If there are four primary partitions already on a hard drive and you wish to create an extended partition on which to create more, one of the primary partitions must be deleted in order to create it.
Let's see, only one extended partition may be created on a hard drive. So you can have one extended partition on each of the hard drives connected to your system. The partition editor will not allow it. And it would serve no purpose at any rate. If you need the extra extended partition space, you only need expand the one you have. An extended partition cannot be formatted with a file system, such as ext4, fat, ntfs, nor can it directly hold data. That is the function of the logical drives which are created within it. So then I guess the extended partition gets its own name. All right, logical partitions. A partition created within an extended partition is called a logical partition. Any number of logical partitions may be created within an extended partition, and they may be formatted with any file system. All operating systems that I am aware of are able to access any logical partition that is formatted to a compatible file system. For instance, while Windows will not recognize a Linux EXT2 partition without a third-party driver, it will be able to access any partition formatted with FAT or NTFS. Oh, so if it can be formatted with any file system, you can set up one to be FAT or NTFS, depending on the version of Windows, Linux, uh, version of Windows. Linux, of course, will access all of these. Uh, let me pause this a second. Actually, I hope you don't mind if I put myself up here for a little bit. Um, let's keep this above the desktop. So keep above others. So when I click this, it stays there. Um, this KDE desktop, pretty nice anyway. All right, the next section in the How to Partition Guide is creating partitions. In the screenshot below, I have a new unformatted hard drive. This drive has no partition. Th this is the Ubuntu Guide. This drive has no partitions created on it and is ready to be partitioned assumes you've installed gparted. First, I'm creating a primary partition. I could just as easily create an extended partition encompassing the entire hard drive, but we'll need this primary partition for later demonstrations. First, click on the free space or on the entry below the graphics that corresponds to the free space that you wish to create the partition in. In this case, the whole drive is empty, so there is only one free space you can select. Once selected, it will be highlighted in the graphics bar, and in the partition list underneath it, click the New button in the toolbar. Alternately, you can right-click in the free space or partition and select the operation from the menu which appears. All right, so what do we have here? This is my, um, can you see it? <laughs> this is my hibiscus tea. Um, so this is the window that appears. Here you can choose between a number of file system types. In this example, I have ext4 selected as my file system type. However, I will be creating a Windows partition for now. I select NTFS from the list. Notice the Create As line above the file types. This is where we select the type of partition we are creating. We will let this stay as primary. We click the Apply button and once the creation process is complete, the partition is created. So uh, now you see who I am. Let's go back to this. 
So the next section after um, creating a partition is resizing a partition. If you wish to create a partition in which to install Ubuntu Linux, for example, on a hard drive which already contains a Windows partition, or if you need to provide more space in an existing partition that is running out of space, you will need to perform one or more partition resizing operations. You can reallocate hard drive space from one partition to another or add previously unallocated space to a partition. Resizing Windows partitions requires special attention and is accomplished in a manner different from that used to resize other types of partitions. When shrinking a partition containing data, attention must be given to the amount of free space left in the partition, especially a Windows partition, but true for any file system. The less room left in a partition, the more likelihood of fragmentation of files, and the harder it will be to defragment that partition. Rule of thumb, leave at least 10% free space on any partition to reduce fragmentation and make defragmentation easier. Note that in order to expand a partition, you must have free space next to it in which to expand. This can be accomplished either by shrinking another partition next to it or moving a or some partition, a partition or some partitions away from it. See the moving a partition page for details on moving a partition. See notes in additional notes on partitions on the Operating Systems and Primary Extended Partitions page for additional restrictions on resizing operations. To resize a partition, first make sure the partition is unmounted. If the partition is mounted, most of the options in the menu will be unavailable, except for one that says Unmount which you should select to unmount the partition. Uh, notice in the image that the partition, partition I'm resizing is the Windows NTFS partition that covers the entire hard drive, which I created earlier. A new Windows computer's hard drive will typically be formatted in this manner. One large partition covering the entire drive. Once you are sure the partition is unmounted, right click on the partition you wish to resize. Let's see, partition unmounted. Click on uh, right click on the partition you want you wish to resize and select resize move from the menu as illustrated above. Uh, where is it illustrated? I don't see it illustrated above. You will then be presented with the following. Now, this thing makes sense, but uh, I don't see it. You the right-click menu illustrated. Actually, pour, let me pause this a second. Uh, actually, I don't have Gparted on this edition of Manjaro. All right, resizing a partition can be done one of two ways. Dragging and sliding, position the cursor over the arrow on either side of the graphical bar shown in the screenshot. Left click and hold, then drag the arrow away from the edge for shrinking or towards the edge into the free space if available to expand it. Two. Changing the new size or the free space preceding following sizes. This can most easily be done by changing the size of the partition itself. 
This is done either by using the up-down arrows to the right of the new size window or by directly editing the size itself in that um, window. Alternately, you can shrink the partition by increasing the non-zero side of the partition in either the, the, the free space preceding or free space following window. If you attempt to expand the partition by decreasing the non-zero side of the partition, preceding or following, depending on where the free space is, it will move the partition instead of increasing its size. The same will apply if free space exists on both sides of the partition. See moving a partition for details. After changing the size of the partition, just click the Resize Move button and the changes will be recorded and visible in a window at the bottom. When you are sure that you have resized it as you desire, you click the Apply button at the top and the partition will be resized. Your hard drive will then be as follows. Okay. Next is creating an extended partition. Creating an extended partition is done the same way as creating a primary partition. Remember the primary type in the menu of the screenshot that I mentioned earlier. That is the menu in which we select the creation of an extended partition. Here's a picture, create a new partition, create as extended. Notice the menu selection in the create as box where we left primary selected for creation of a primary partition. This time we select extended. When extended is selected, all the file types in the menu below will be grayed out. Excuse me. There is no file type associated with an extended partition. An extended partition is basically a container for any number of logical partitions, which can be of any file system format. Above is the created extended partition you would normally cover the entire remaining free space with this partition unless you intend to install another operating system which requires free space to be installed into. The extended partition is represented by a box in the graphics portion surrounding the remaining free space. The extended partition can be resized to create room for expansion of the existing primary partition or the creation of an additional primary partition of additional of an additional or of additional primary partitions you will notice a third partition type option in the create as drop down menu this option is to create a logical partition inside of the extended partition we are about to create. Create as. Um, okay. When you click on a free space, which type of partition that may be created depends on the location of the free space you are selecting. If it is outside of an extended partition, you will only be able to create a primary or an extended partition. If the free space resides within an extended partition, you will only be allowed to create a logical partition. Creating a logical partition is otherwise exactly the same as creating a primary partition. Below, I have erased all the partitions that I created earlier 
in primary partition rules and conventions, except for the NTFS partition, which would contain the Windows operating system, and replace them with an extended partition covering the rest of the free space. I then created a number of logical partitions inside of it to demonstrate how an extended partition works. Let's see, SDA1, he has NTFS, SDA2 extended, SDA5 uh, in the extended partition. So he starts with SDA5, uh, then goes to 6, 7, 8, and 9 in the extended. He has an EXT4, an EXT4, a FAT32, an NTFS, and a Linux swap partition in the extended partition. Wow, it's a 102 gigabyte swap partition. Notice that I have recreated the original Linux partitions. Oh, I see, they're all the same size here. Notice um, they're all 102.4 gigabytes. Notice that I have recreated the original Linux partitions and created five more partitions called logical partitions of various file systems within the extended partition to demonstrate how an extended partition works. Note also the order of the list of partitions below the graphics. Any partition that precedes the extended partition is a primary partition. Those that follow it in the list are logical partitions. I can create any number of logical partitions of any file type and any size within this extended partition. Note that you can apply any operation to an extended partition except formatting it as a file system. You must create logical partitions within it, and those may be formatted. Note also that an extended partition cannot be deleted until all the logical partitions existing in it are deleted first. Okay, so any operation to an extended partition and the extended partition cannot be deleted until all the logical ones are removed. Okay, let's read the moving a uh, partition uh, since it's the next section. There are times when you wish to increase the size of a partition, and there is free space on the disk, but it is not next to the partition you need to expand. In this case, you will need to move one or more partitions to move that free space next to the target partition. For this demonstration, I have the hard disk set up with a typical Windows Ubuntu installation. We have root, that's the forward slash partition, a larger home, that's the forward slash home partition, and then a swap partition with free space at the end of the disk. We have run out of room in the home partition and need to give it more room, but we have no free space next to it in which to expand we must move the swap partition. Note that moving a partition is particularly dangerous and is more liable to data loss or corruption. When a partition is moved, the files on that partition must be moved with it. As was said at the start, always back up your data before performing a partitioning operation. It is a good idea to back up the entire drive to a remote location. Modern partition editors are pretty safe, but there is always the chance that the operations will be interrupted before finished. Like, say, the fuse in the computer's power supply blows. If something like this were to happen, you will potentially lose all the partitions and files on the entire hard drive and have to start over. Beware. I have had the above happen to me. That's the writer of this. I have hosed and had to reformat 
an entire hard drive and reconstruct it. The vast majority of the time, partitioning is easy and safe. But if you don't back up your hard drive before performing these operations, you're setting yourself up to get bit. After assuming that the swap partition is unmounted, first select the partition by right-clicking on it and selecting Resize Move from the menu. In the above screenshot, the representation of the partition starts off at the left side of the graphical bar and the free space preceding it is at zero. To move the partition, left click and hold on the partition itself rather than the arrows at the side as with resizing. Then drag the partition to the desired location. Hmm. I think I've been confused on this particular screen before. Notice that the free space preceding following values are now both non-zero. See, free space, preceding, free space following. Alternatively, you can vary either the free space preceding or the free space following. As long as neither value is or reaches zero. Adjust either one, and the other will automatically self-adjust to reflect the movement. If you adjust both, the new size and one of the free space values, the partition will resize as well as... Now this says moved, but I think they mean to say, if you adjust both the new size and one of the free space values, the partition will be resized Oh, as well as moved. No, that's right. This is particularly useful if you need to resize and move the partition, since this can be done in one operation. When we have completed moving the swap partition to the end of the drive, the free space following value is now zero, and the free space preceding value is the same as free space following was at the beginning of the operation. Then we can expand the home partition into the free space beside it. Uh, you know, I would like, oh, I see. This adjusting is being done inside the logical, the extended partition. It's being done with the logical partitions. Up here, if you look, uh, oh, and they don't show the home folder before the change on this. Reformatting a partition. There are times when you might desire to reformat a partition to another type of file system, or that was formatted to the incorrect file system by accident. This can be accomplished through the use of Gparted or most any other partitioning tool. Any partition except for an extended partition may be reformatted to any other file system type that you desire. Be aware that reformatting a partition will destroy any data existing on that partition. Be sure to back up any data you want to save before reformatting. Formatting an unformatted partition or reformatting an existing partition with Gparted can be accomplished as follow, follows. 1. Select the partition you wish to reformat by right-clicking either on the graphical display or on the line below it that corresponds to the partition that you wish to reformat. If the partition is mounted, you must unmount it first. Click on the Unmount option in the menu. 2. Position your cursor over Format 2 in the menu. 
a second menu will appear with file systems to which you can format the selected partition. 3. Click on the file system to which you want to format your partition. This will set the job up to be done and show the pending changes in a window at the bottom of the partition editor. 4. When you are sure that you have the correct file system selected and wish to apply the changes, click the Apply button at the top to apply the changes. Next is deleting a partition. If you have a partition which you don't need anymore, the easiest way possible to create more space in which to install Ubuntu or expand an existing one is to delete that partition. This potentially creates a large amount of free space in which to create your Linux file system depending on the size of the partition that you are deleting. Of course, the usual caveat applies. Back up any files or data that you wish to preserve to another partition or removable media before you delete the partition. Once deleted, the data will be difficult, if not impossible, to recover. To delete a partition, Right-click on the partition that you wish to delete and select Delete from the menu. Once you are sure that you've selected the correct partition and are positive that you have backed up all the files or data that you wish to save from that partition, click the Apply button at the top of the window and the partition will be deleted. Next section, Operating Systems and Primary Extended Partitions. Since most new Linux users are migrating from and dual booting with Windows, it's import important to note the following. Some operating systems, such as Windows, require the operating system to be installed in and booted from a primary partition. For Windows to run properly, certain files must be in the beginning of the primary or master hard drive. The MBR, master boot record, resides at the very beginning of the master hard drive, indicated by Linux as HD0 or SD0, and is checked first for the record of bootable partitions. Linux installs stage one of GRUB in the MBR which has a list of bootable partitions and operating systems. Other operating systems, such as Linux, will boot and run from either a primary or a logical partition on any hard drive on your system, as long as GRUB resides on the primary hard drive in the master boot record area. As such, the rest of the hard drive may be an extended partition as well, with Linux or any other operating system that will boot from a logical drive. Personally, I would recommend that any Linux installation be done on a logical partition. Linux will boot from either, and it will save you problems later down the road should you need or want to create additional partitions beyond the four primary partitions allowed. In addition, it will conserve primary space for installation of other operating systems that require a primary partition, should you desire to install one. Windows is able to access properly formatted logical drives. Therefore, it hurts nothing to have one primary par partition for the operating system itself to reside in and the rest of the partitions for Windows to be an extended partition. All right, additional notes on partitions. One, a primary partition cannot be expanded into free space encompassed by an extended partition. Primary partition 
cannot be expanded into free space. Well, yeah, that makes sense. Nor can a logical partition be expanded into free space outside of the extended partition. Uh, that sounds like common sense. The only way to expand a primary partition that is bordered by an extended partition is to create space within the extended partition and then shrink it, creating free space outside of it in which to expand the primary partition. The only way to expand a logical partition is to create free space next to it and within the extended partition. You must either expand the extended partition or move and or shrink other logical partitions to place free space next to it that is within the extended partition. A logical partition cannot be moved outside of an extended partition. I think we just said that, right? Nor can a primary partition be moved into an extended partition. I think we said that too in number one. However, if there is enough free space, you can copy a primary partition into the extended partition, resulting in a logical partition or vice versa, and delete the original, resulting in a copy operation. Oh, well, that's actually a good idea. Three, one partition cannot be moved past another partition in either direction i.e. the order of the partitions on the hard drive cannot be changed. If it is necessary, the only way that two or three above may be accomplished is to back up the data contained in the partition you wish to relocate, delete that partition, then create it in the free space or position desired. Once it is created, the data can be copied back into it. Of course, if it has hidden operating system files in it, it is best to back up the original partition to an image file and restore the image to the newly created partition. Okay, that's kind of interesting, that comment about the image file. As was mentioned above, when shrinking a partition, you should leave some free space to reduce the likelihood of fragmentation and make it easier to defragment. Fragmented files will cause your computer to run slower and increase the possibility of file corruption. A rule of thumb is to keep at least 10% of the partition as free space. Personally, I like at least 25%. When you create or delete partitions, the naming or drive letter assignment of all the partitions will change. This is particularly bothersome on Windows, some of whose software will store the drive letter to which its stored files have been written, as well as the drive letters which are assigned to removable media. Linux will also experience some difficulties in this area, particularly if you have some of them entered in FSTAB, FSTAB. Note that this will not affect your Windows drive letter order when you install Ubuntu. Windows does not recognize the ext3 or swap file systems, and as such, creation of these partitions will not affect it. Neither will the creation of an extended partition. The next section is partition editors and backup. I'm not really going to read that. Um, but it includes the Ubuntu Live CD. Um, the Gparted Live CD, which apparently is at Source Forge. Parted Magic RAM boot version. So partedmagic.com. Um, How to Forge has screenshots and instructions on using Part of Magic RAM boot approach. Special section on backup tools, backing up your system. The community wiki has a section on that. So that's at help.ubuntu.com forward slash community forward slash backup your system. There's a Clonezilla Live CD. And this he says here, far and away my favorite Live CD backup tool is Clonezilla. 
It will allow you to back up and restore not only separate partitions, but create images of your whole hard drive as well. Part image. Um, this is the partition imager which Clonezilla is based on, but not as automated as Clonezilla. There's a partimage.org forward slash main underscore page for its home page. And uh, an excellent step-by-step -step tutorial on using Clonezilla Live can be found at dedoimedo dot com forward slash computers forward slash free underscore imaging underscore software. The System Rescue CD uh, is another one, and Ping, uh, and he says he has not tried Ping. Now, Ubuntu did a good job on that guide. Next, we'll go look at Manjaro. All right, here's the Manjaro page. Um, if I look down here, there's cookies. By using, you agreed to our use of cookies. I really don't like cookies, but not computer ones anyway. <laughs> My wife looked at me when I said that. Overview. Manjaro uses a text-based disk partitioning cool tool called CF Disk. How you choose to partition your hard disk manually is largely down to personal preference. However, some guidance has been provided, particularly for any new users wishing to manually partition their hard disks. Partitioning, that is dividing your hard disk when installing an operating system, may be undertaken for a number of different reasons. The most common examples include meeting the requirements of certain operating systems, uh, ability to install um, multiple operating systems, separating parts of the hard, hard disk for specific purposes, for example, for booting or to serve as virtual memory or swap, and separating parts of the hard disk to store specific types of files, system files, personal files, and so on. Primary and logical partitions. There's two types of partition that may be used. Uh, they're primary and logical. We talked about that in the other video. I mean the other uh, under Ubuntu. Primary partitions are a throwback to the early days of computing and only allow for a hard disk to be divided into a maximum of four parts. For example, you can have a maximum of four primary partitions or three primaries in one extended partition, which may contain several logical partitions depending upon the architecture. They are, in essence, a way of further subdividing one primary partition into logical partitions and, um, and, and is known as, a, as logical partitions. For example, uh, SDA1 is the first primary, SDA2 the second primary, SDA3 the third primary, SDA4 is the fourth extended primary partition. And it's not actually usable as a primary partition. Inside of it is SDA5, the fifth logical uh, partition. SDA6, the sixth logical partition. SDA7, the seventh logical partition. SDA8, the eighth logical partition, and so on, depending upon your disk space and needs. While the maximum number of primary partitions allowed on any drive is four. Through using logical partitions, an IDE drive can be subdivided into just over 60 partitions. While an SCSI, 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 SCSI drive can be divided into over a dozen. 
Below is a simple illustration of how logical partitions can be used to partition a hard disk into eight parts. Um, courtesy of LennoxQuestions.org. Conventions and Guides. The Convention for Listing Drives and Partitions is SD, Hard Disk Letter, Partition Number. For example, the first or only hard disk connected to your system will be listed as SDA, the second SDB, and so on. In respect to partitions, SDA1 would be the first partition found in the first hard disk. SDA2 would be the second partition, and so on. Logical partitions will always begin from 5. Okay, you got that? Logical partitions always begin from 5. Unlike Windows, which requires that there is a primary partition specifically to boot, Linux systems such as Manjaro have no specific requirements for the use of primary or logical partitions. For example, Manjaro may be installed using all primary partitions, all logical partitions, or a mixture of the two. Although the assisted preparation method creates separate partitions for the grub, that's boot, virtual memory, that's swap, Manjaro operating system, that's root, and personal files, that's home. This is an entirely optional setup. For example, the boot, root, and home partitions can be easily combined into a single partition. This is the case with other popular distributions such as Mint. Uh, well, actually, I like that Manjaro does this. Manjaro apparently makes a separate boot, separate swap, Manjaro operating system root, and a uh, home, uh, uh, as separate um, partitions. Separating or combining partitions is where personal preference comes in. Each setup will have its own advantages and disadvantages. For example, separating boot, root and home has the advantage of easily backing up and or repairing problems without affecting anything else. A disadvantage is the potential to run out of pre-allocated space for a partition, e.g. the root, even if ample space is available on the hard disk itself. Although allocating a swap partition is itself entirely optional, it is still strongly recommended that you do so, particularly if you wish to use hibernate or suspend functions, as these will require use of a swap partition. Manjaro should therefore be installed using a minimum of two partitions. Unless you know exactly what you're doing, the size of of the swap partition should be the same as the amount of RAM your system is using. Well, that makes sense. If you're going to use Hibernate, you'll, uh, you'll want to have a swap partition equal to what would have been maybe saved in your RAM, right? So uh, two gigabytes of space would be allocated to a swap partition if using two gigabytes of RAM memory. However, you decide to parti partition your hard disk. Almost any of them can be designated as a bootable partition and contain the grub. The exception is the swap partition. Two Linux operating systems installed on the same system can share the same grub and swap partition. They don't need one each. And I think they could share the home as well. They didn't mention that, though. Where using an existing Linux 
partition table. It is worthwhile noting that the Manjaro installer will not overwrite a home folder if it contains an existing username. As a consequence, the pre-installed desktop environment will lose its Manjaro configurations and revert back to its basic vanilla settings. In order to restore the Manjaro configuration settings, having booted into the freshly installed system, it will be necessary to enter the following command in your terminal. I'm not sure what this means here. cp -a, uh, and then um, it's, you can look at it in the picture. For example, for an account called Carl, the following command would be entered. Once complete, it will then be necessary to ensure you have full ownership of the home folder by entering the following command. Ah, C-H-O-W-N dash R username forward slash home forward slash username. So that would be change owner. For example, for the same account called Carl, the following command would be entered. Okay, so there are, um, they have an installation guide that looks relatively short. For best results, please ensure Manjaro is connected to the internet prior to starting the installation process. Installation guides for every release have been provided. Oh, I don't need, we don't need that for partitioning. How about basic partitioning scenarios? CF disk basic partitioning scenarios. Now what year are these, is there a date? This page was edit, edited 7 September 2021. And the CF disk page, which has a good number of pictures. Um, was edited September 2021. Let's see. Uh, Control plus usually increases the, okay. The partitioning overview and existing partition tables guide provides an overview and explanation of primary and logical partitions, as well as advice on what to do if intending to use a shared home partition. Didn't we see that already? Yes. That was this. Basic partitioning scenarios have been presented below for illustrative purposes. In particular, the intention is to illustrate the substantial degree of flexibility when deciding upon an appropriate partitioning scheme when using CF disk. Okay, here they give a two partition scenario. Um, and I'm not really interested in a two partition scenario. Okay, let's look at a three partition scenario. In this scenario, a partition will be created especially for boot, separate from the partition for root and home. A separate swap partition will also be created. All the partitions created will be primary partitions. In order to create a new partition, Use your arrow keys to switch through the options and choose new. There are two preferences when creating partitions, primary and logical partitions. It's good to know that you can only create four primary partitions per hard drive. Choose the desired preference, then press enter to select it. We are now going to create the boot partition. 
For the boot partition, 100 megabytes and higher in recommend. That is recommended. You should put an is there. Enter the desired size and press enter. After that, the beginning option will be highlighted. It is recommended, it's recommended to keep it, uh, you should probably say it is recommended here because actually, oh, anyway, it's, it is recommended to keep it that way. Press enter to continue. We also need to make the boot partition bootable. Press enter when bootable is highlighted. We are now going to create a swap partition. After creating the boot partition, use your up down arrow keys and choose free space. Use your arrow keys to navigate to the new option then. Press enter. After that, press enter again when the primary reference is highlighted. Now enter a size for your swap partition. The recommended size for the swap partition is the same as your RAM. In this tutorial, we're going to make a 1 gigabyte swap partition. For that, we will enter 1000 because CF disk measures the size in megabytes. So they're interpreting 1 gigabyte as 1000 megabytes. Because we'll use this partition for swap, we have to change its type. So when the type option is highlighted, press enter. You will be prompted with a list of file systems. For swap, we'll have to enter 82. We'll confirm by pressing enter. I don't see swap listed on the screen here, do you? So I don't even see 82 on here. After that, we are going to create a root, that's forward slash partition. Here's where the operating system is going to be installed. Again, use your up down keys to select the free space option. Press enter to confirm. Using your arrow keys, choose new from the options at the bottom then press enter. Enter the size in megabytes for your root partition. The recommended size for the root partition would be four gigabytes or more and confirm it by pressing the enter key. After that, you'll be prompted with your new partition scheme. To continue, use your arrow keys and select the right option at the bottom and press enter. This will apply the changes we've made so far. That being done, use your arrow keys and select the quit option and press enter to exit CF disk. Finalizing the disk preparation. Now hit enter on the done option. Press enter again when you get prompted with some information about what's coming next. You will be prompted with a list of available drives. Choose the one you partitioned earlier, then press enter. You will now have to select the swap partition. In this case, it's dev SDA2. Use your arrow keys and highlight your previous created previously created swap partition and press enter. When getting prompted for formatting the swap partition, choose yes and hit enter. This will format the partition. The changes cannot be reverted. You will now have to select the root forward slash partition. In this particular case, it's forward slash dev forward slash SDA3. You'll be prompted with a list of file systems. Choose one of them, preferably ext4, and hit enter. 
choose yes when prompted to format the partition. There will be an option to mount static partitions as boot. Here you'll select the boot partition you've created earlier. Now you will have to select a file system for your boot partition. The ext2 file system is recommended, but not necessary. Set the mount point to boot, then hit enter. Select yes and press enter when prompted for formatting. You will be able to mount other partitions at boot up. It's very useful in case you have a home partition, for example. Otherwise, select Done and hit Enter. An informational window will be prompted. Here you will be able to see info about your previously created partitions, including the mount points and types. Hit Enter if you want to continue. Note this will write the changes to your hard drive. The process, it says here, if irreversible, but I think you mean to say the process is irreversible. If you choose to continue, selected yes, um, the installer will format and set mount points for your partitions. The process will take just a few seconds. Depending on your hardware, press enter when prompted with the success message. Now we're done setting up partitions Use your arrow keys and highlight main menu, then press enter. Okay, next after Manjaro is Arch. So we go to the Arch wiki, partitioning. Disk partitioning or disk slicing is the creation of one or more regions on secondary storage so that each region can be managed separately from Wikipedia. An entire disk may be allocated to a single partition. Let's make this bigger. Uh, or multiple ones for cases such as dual booting. Maintaining a swap partition or to logically separate data such as audio and video files. The partitioning scheme is stored in a partition table such as master boot record, MBR, or GUID partition table, GPT. Partition tables are created and modified using one of many partitioning tools. The tools available for Arch Linux are listed in the Partitioning Tools section. Partitions usually contain a file system directly which is accomplished by creating a file system on, aka formatting, the, pa the partition. Alternatively, partitions can contain LVM, Block Device Encryption, or RAID which ultimately provide device files on which a file system can be placed or the devices can be stacked further. Any block device, e.g. disk partition LUX device, LVM logical volume or RAID array that directly contains a mountable file system is called a volume. Now, before I continue, let me show you this page was last edited in February 2022. And right now it's March 24th, just a month ago. So this is pretty current. So the, we're going to cover the partition table, partition scheme, tools, partition alignment, GPT kernel support, troubleshoot. Uh, and troubleshooting. For the partition table, there are two main types of partition table available. These are described below in the master boot record, MBR, and the GUID partition table sections, along with the discussion on how to choose between the two. A third less common alternative is using a partitionless disk, which is also discussed. 
Use a partitioning tool to view the partition table of a block device. Tip, run parted, uh, dev sdx print, or fdisk-l dev sdx, where dev sdx is the block device, such as dev sda for a SATA disk, dev nvme 0n1 for an nvme disk, or dev mmc blk0 for uh, an emmc disk. See device file block device names for more information on block device naming. Master boot record. The master boot record, MBR, is the first 512 bytes of a storage device. It contains an operating system bootloader and the storage device's partition table. It plays an important role in the boot process under BIOS systems. See Wikipedia Master Boot Record Disk Partitioning for the MBR structure. The MBR is not located in a partition. It is located at the first sector of the device, physical offset zero, preceding the first partition. The boot sector present, present on a partitionless device or within an individual partition is called a volume boot record, VBR, instead. So MBR is not located in a partition. It's located at the first sector of the device, physical offset zero, preceding the first partition, whatever that means. All right, master boot record bootstrap code. The first 440 bytes of MBR are the bootstrap code area. On BIOS systems, it usually contains the first stage of the bootloader. The bootstrap code can be backed up, restored from backup, or erased using DD. Master boot record partition table. In the MBR partition table, also known as DOS or MS-DOS partition table, there are three types of partitions, primary, extended, and logical. We went over that before, but let's see what Arch has to say, Arch Lennox, about it. Primary partitions can be bootable and are limited to four partitions per disk or RAID volume. If the MBR partition table requires more than four partitions, then one of the primary partitions needs to be replaced by an extended partition containing logical partitions within it. Extended partitions can be thought of as containers for logical partitions. A hard disk can contain no more than one extended partition. The extended partition is also counted as a primary partition. So if the disk has an extended partition, only three additional primary partitions are possible. Three primary partitions and one extended partition. The number of logical partitions residing in an extended partition is unlimited. A system that dual boots with Windows will require for Windows to reside in a primary partition. The customary numbering scheme is to create primary partitions SDA1 through SDA3, followed by an extended partition SDA4. The logical partitions on SDA4 are numbered SDA5, SDA6, etc. Tip, when partitioning the master boot record MBR disk, consider leaving at least 33 512-byte sectors, that's 16.5 kilobytes, of free unpartitioned space at the end of the disk in case you ever decide to confer, convert it to GPT. The space will be required for the backup GPT header. GUID partition table. 
uh, the GPT, the GUI partition table, is a partitioning scheme that is part of the UEFI, Unified Extensible Firmware Interface Specification. It uses globally unique identifiers, GUIDs or UUIDs in the Linux world, to define partitions and partition types. It is designed to succeed the master boot record partitioning scheme me method. At the start of a GUID partition table disk, there is a protective master boot record, PMBR, to protect against GPT unaware software. This protective MBR, just like an ordinary MBR, has a bootstrap code area which can be used for BIOS GPT booting with bootloaders that support it. Choosing between GPT and MBR. GYD partition table GPT is an alternative contemporary partitioning style. It is intended to replace the old master boot record MBR system. GPT has several advantages over MBR, which has quirks dating back to MS-DOS times. With the recent developments to the formatting tools, it is equally easy to get good dependability and performance for GPT or MBR. Note, for Grub to boot from a GPT partitioned disk on a BIOS-based system, a BIOS boot partition is required. Some points to consider when choosing. To dual boot with Windows, both 32 and 64-bit using legacy BIOS, the MBR scheme is required. All right, well, I'm not dual booting Windows, so I'm going to skip that. If you're installing an older hardware, especially on old laptops, consider choosing MBR because its BIOS might not support GPT, but see below how to fix it. If you are partitioning a disk that is larger than two terabytes, you need to use GPT. So I have to use GPT. It is recommended to always use GPT for UEFI boot, as some UEFI implementations do not support booting to the MBR while in UEFI mode. If none of the above apply, choose freely between GPT and MBR. Since GPT is more modern, it is recommended in this case. Some advantages of GPT over MBR are provides a unique disk GUID and unique partition GUID, part UUID, for each partition, a good file system independent way of referencing partitions and disks. GUIDs are a prerequisite for the discoverable partitions specification that can be utilized in a systemd enabled initra mfs provides a file system independent partition name part label arbitrary number of partitions depends on space allocated for the partition table no need for extended and logical partitions by default, the GPT table contains space for defining 128 partitions. However, if you want to define more partitions, you can allocate more space to the partition table. Currently, only GDisk is known to support this feature. Uses 64-bit LBA for storing sector numbers. Maximum addressable disk size is 2 ZIB. MBR is limited to addressing two TIB of space per drive. Stores a backup header and partition table at the end of the disk that aids recovery in case the primary ones are damaged. CRC32 checksums to detect errors and corruption of the header 
and partition table. The section on partitioning tools contains a table indicating which tools are available for creating and modifying GPT and MBR tables. Partition list disk. Uh, this section needs expansion, like when one might want to use a partition list disk, e.g. in virtual machines, and when not and why. Excuse me. Partition list disk, a.k.a. super floppy, refers to a storage device without a partition table. Having one file system occupying the whole storage device, the boot sector present on a partitionless device is called a volume boot record, VBR. BTRFS partitioning. BTRFS can occupy an entire data storage device and replace the MBR or GPT partitioning schemes. See the BTRFS partition list BTRFS disk instructions for details. Partition scheme. This article or section needs expansion. Reason. Introduce LVM, MDADM, DMCrypt, etc. They can be placed in a new subsection together with the information about BTRFS subvolume. Discuss and talk colon partitioning. There are no strict rules for partitioning a hard drive, although one may follow the general guidance, guidance given below. A disk partitioning scheme is determined by various issues such as desired flexibility, speed, security, as well as the limitations imposed by available disk space. It is essentially personal preference. If you would like to dual boot Arc Linux into Windows operating system, please see dual boot with Windows. Note, UEFI systems typically need an EFI system partition. BIOS systems that are partitioned with GPT require a BIOS boot partition if GRUB is used as the bootloader. Tip, if using BTRFS, subvolumes can be used to imitate partitions. See the BTRFS mounting subvolume section. Single root partition. This scheme is the simplest and should be enough for most cases. A swap file can be created and easily resized as needed. It usually makes sense to start by considering a single root that's forward slash partition and then separate out others based on specific use cases like RAID encryption, a shared media partition, etc. Discrete partitions. This article or section needs expansion. Reason. List the appropriate GPT partition type, GUIDs, Discuss and talk partitioning. Separating out a path as a partition allows for the choice of a different file system and mount options. In some cases, like a media partition, they can also be shared between operating systems. Below are some example layouts that can be used when partitioning, and the following subsections detail a few of the directories which can be placed on their own separate partition and then mounted at mount points under forward slash the root, uh, that's the root directory. See file hierarchy for a full description of the contents of these directories. The root directory is the top of the hierarchy. The point where the primary file system is mounted and from which all other file systems stem. All files and directories appear under the root directory, even if they are stored on different physical devices. The contents of the root file system must be adequate to boot, restore, recover, and or repair the system. 
Therefore, certain directories under the root directory forward slash are not candidates for separate partitions. The root directory partition, the forward slash partition or root partition is necessary and it is the most important. The other partitions can be replaced by it. Warning, directories essential for booting, except for forward slash boot, must be the forward slash partition or root partition is necessary. Okay. Warning, directories essential for booting must be the same uh, as root or mounted in early user space by the Initra MFS. These essential directories are forward slash etc and forward slash usr. Uh, the root traditionally contains the forward slash usr directory, which can grow significantly depending upon how much software is installed. 15 to 20 gigabytes should be sufficient for most users with modern hard disks. If you plan to store a swap file here, you might need a larger partition size. Slash boot. The forward slash boot directory contains the kernel and RAM disk images, as well as the bootloader configuration file and bootloader stages. It also stores data that is used before the kernel begins executing user space programs. Forward slash boot is not required for normal system operation, but only during boot and kernel upgrades when regenerating the initial RAM disk. A separate forward slash boot partition is only required if your bootloader is not capable of accessing the boot directory that resides in the root in forward slash the root directory. For example, if the bootloader does not support that file system, or if your forward slash is on a stacked block device, e.g., software RAID, a I think that should be an encrypted volume or a LVM volume and the bootloader does not have drivers for it. See Arch Boot Process Bootloader for more information on bootloader requirements and capabilities. If booting using an UEFI bootloader that does not have drivers for other file systems, it is recommended to mount the EFI system partition to forward slash boot. See EFI system partition, mount the partition for more information. A suggested size for forward slash boot is 200 megabytes unless you are using EFI system partition as forward slash boot, in which case at least 300 megabytes is recommended. Warning. File systems can get new features not yet supported by bootloaders, making them unsuitable for a forward slash boot partition unless incompatible features remain disabled. Forward slash home. The forward slash home directory contains user specific configuration files caches, application data, and media files. Separate, separating out forward slash home allows the root directory forward slash to be repartitioned separately. But note that you can still reinstall Arch with the forward slash home untouched even if it is not separate. The other top level directories just need to be removed and then Packstrap can be run. You should not share home directories between users on different distributions because they use incompatible software versions and patches. 
Instead, consider sharing a media partition or at least using different home directories on the same home partition. The size of this partition varies. Okay, that was slash home. Slash var. The slash var directory stores variable data such as spool directories and files, administrative and logging data, Pacmans, that's the package manager, uh, cache, etc. That's in slash var. It is used, for example, for caching and logging, and hence frequently read or written. Keeping it in a separate partition avoids running out of disk space due to flunky logs, etc. It exists to make it possible to mount slash USR is read only. Everything that historically went into slash USR that is written to during system operation as opposed to installation and software maintenance must reside under slash VAR. Note slash VAR contains many small files. The choice of file system type should consider this fact if a separate partition is used. Slash VAR will contain, among other data, the Pac-Man cache. Retaining these packages is helpful in case a package upgrade causes instability requiring downgrade to an older archived package. The Pac-Man cache will grow as the system is expanded and updated, but it can be safely cleared if space becomes an issue. 8 to 12 gigabytes on a desktop system should be su sufficient for slash VAR, depending on how much software will be installed. Slash data or slash DATA. One can consider mounting a data partition to cover various files to be shared by all users. Using the slash home partition for this purpose is fine as well. The size of this partition varies. Swap. A swap is a file partition that provides disk space using a virtual memory. Swap files and swap partitions are equally performant but swap files are much easier to resize as needed. A swap partition can potentially be shared between operating systems, but not if hibernation is used. Historically, the general rule for swap partition size was to allocate twice the amount of physical RAM. As computers have gained ever larger memory capacities, this rule is outdated. For example, on average desktop machines with up to 512 megabytes RAM, the two times rule is usually adequate. If a sufficient amount of RAM, more than 1,024 megabytes, is available, it may be possible to have a smaller swap partition. To use hibernation, aka suspended disk, it is advisable to create the swap partition at the size of RAM, although the kernel will try to compress the suspend to disk image to fit the swap space. There is no guarantee it will succeed if the used swap space is significantly smaller than RAM. See Power Management Suspend and Hibernate Hibernation for more information. Example layouts. This article or section needs expansion. Reason. Improve current examples. Discuss. Talk partitioning table draft 2. The following examples use slash dev slash SDA as the example disk with slash dev slash SDA1 as the first partition. The block device naming scheme will differ if you are partitioning a NVMe disk, e.g. dev NVMe 0 and 1, with partitions starting from dev 
NVMe 0, N1, P1, or an SD card or eMMC disk, e.g. dev MMC BLK 0, with partitions starting from dev MMC BLK 0, P1. See device file block device names for more information. UEFI booting does not involve any boot flag. Booting relies solely on the boot entries in NVRAM. Parted and its front ends use a boot flag on GPT to indicate that a partition is an EFI system partition. There is no requirement to have all required wanted partitions on the same disk or to use the same type of partition table for all disks. UEFI GPT layout example. Mount point on the installed system. Slash boot or slash EFI uh, with a one footnote. Swap and forward slash. Partition slash dev slash SDA1 for the boot or EFI. Slash dev slash SDA2 for the swap. And slash dev slash SDA3 for the root. Um, partition type GUID. EFI system partition. Linux swap. Linux x86-64 root. Suggested size, at least 300 megabytes for the boot or EFI, more than 512 megabytes uh, for the swap and remainder of the device forward slash. BIOS MBR layout example. Mount point on the installed system, swap on SDA1 and the root on SDA2 and then unallocated space. So the partition type was Linux swap, that's 82, Linux, that's 83, and then NA. Boot flag was no on the swap, yes on the, for, the root, and NA on, on the other one. Uh, more than 512 megabytes on the swap, the remainder of the device on the root, and at least 16.5 kilobytes at the end of the disk. BIOS GPT layout example. Mount point on the installed system. There's none, swap, and root. The partition was SDA1 for none, 2 for swap, and 3 for the root. Um, the partition type GUID for none was BIOS boot partition, then Linux swap, and then Linux x86 dash 64 root forward slash. The suggested size was one megabyte for the none, SDA1, BIOS boot partition, uh, more than 512 megabytes for the swap, Linux swap, and the remainder of the device uh, for the size for the other one. Now that one footnote was the ESP um, under the UEFI GPT layout example. Um, was uh, the ESP can be mounted to slash EFI if the used bootloader is capable of accessing the file system and everything above it on which the kernel and Initra MFS images are located. See EFI system partition typical mount points and the warning in Arch boot process bootloader for details. All unpartitioned space of at least 33 512 byte sectors, 16.5 kilobytes, at the end of the disk to allow converting to GPT in the future. The space will be required for the backup GPT header. The recommendation to preserve an unpartitioned space applies to all MBR partition disks. 3. A BIOS boot partition is only required when using GRUB for BIOS booting from a GPT disk. 
the partition has nothing to do with forward slash boot and it must not be formatted with a file system or mounted. Tools, partitioning tools. The following programs are used to create and or manipulate device partition tables and partitions. See the linked articles for the exact commands to be used. This table will help you to choose utility for your needs. Dialog, MBR, FDisk, and Parted, GPT, FDisk, GDisk, and Parted, Pseudo Graphics, CFDisk, GPT, that's under MBR, and under GPT, CFDisk, and CGDisk, Non Interactive, under MBR is SFDisk and Parted, under GPT, is SF disk, SG disk, and parted. Graphical under MBR is G parted, GNOME disk utility, and partition manager. Under GPT is G parted, GNOME disk utility, and partition manager. For graphical. Warning, two partition devices use a partitioning to tool compatible to the chosen type of partition table. Incompatible tools may result in the destruction of that table, along with existing partitions or data. FDisk and its related utilities are described in the FDisk article. Um, GPT FDisk. GDisk and its related utilities are described in the GDisk article. GNU Parted. These group tools are described in the GNU Parted article. That's GNU Parted, GNOME Disks, G Parted, and KDE Partition Manager. Wonder if I have that here. KDE. Ah, look at that. Uh, okay. Cancel. Close. Uh, do I have to kill this? Process? Goodness. Uh, give me a second. Well, that was a little bit of a pain on the KDE partition manager, but I understand why a password is required. You don't want people messing with your, you know, your disks there. Um, let's see, that's under GNU parted backup. F disk can create a backup of the partition table. GPT FDisk can create a binary backup consisting of the protective MBR, the main GPT header, the backup GPT header, and one copy of the partition table. Recovery, GPART, a utility that guesses the contents of a destroyed MBR partition table. Its usage is, um, okay, GPT FDisk, a partitioning tool that can restore the primary GPT header located at the start of the disk from the secondary GPT header located at the end of the disk or vice versa. Um, test disk. A utility that supports recovering lost partitions on both MBR and GPT. Partition alignment. FDisk, GDisk, and Parted handle alignment automatically. See GNU Parted check alignment if you want to verify your alignment after partitioning. For certain drives, advanced format might be able to provide a better performing alignment. GPT kernel support. The config EFI partition option in the kernel config 
enables GPT support in the kernel, despite the name EFI partition. This option must be built in the kernel and not compiled as a loadable module. This option is required even if GPT disks are used only for data storage and not for booting. This option is enabled by default in all Arch's officially supported kernels. In case of a custom kernel, enable this option by doing config EFI partition equals Y. Of course, Y would be yes. Troubleshooting. Tricking old BIOS into booting from GPT. Some old BIOS, BIOSes from before year 2010 attempt to parse the boot sector and refuse to boot it if it does not contain a bootable MBR partition. This is a problem if one wants to use GPT on this disk because from the BIOS viewpoint, it contains only one non-bootable MBR partition of type EE, i.e. the protective MBR partition. One can mark the protective MBR entry as bootable using fdisk-t MBR dev SDA. And it will work on some biases. However, the UEFI specification prohibits the protective MBR partition entry from being bootable. And UF, UEFI base boards do care about this, even in the legacy boot mode. So this matters if one wants to create a GPT-based USB flash drive that is supposed to boot both on modern UEFI-based boards and also on old BIOSes that insist on finding a bootable MBR partition. It is not possible to solve this problem using traditional tools such as FDisk or GDisk, but it is possible to create a fake MBR partition entry suitable for both kinds of BIOSes manually as a sequence of bytes. The command below will overwrite the second MBR partition slot and add a bootable partition there of type 0, i.e. unused, covering only the first sector of the device. It will not interfere with the GPT or with the first MBR partition entry, which normally contains a protective MBR partition. I'm not reading that. You can see it on the screen. The end result will look like this. Okay, and you can see that on the screen. Drives are not visible when firmware RAID is enabled. If a SATA or NVMe drive is visible in firmware setup, but not to Linux, e.g. FDisk-L does not list it, it is possible that the controller is in firmware RAID mode. For NVMe, the journal should show something like, the solution is to enter firmware setup and change the SATA controller operation mode from RAID to AHCI. I guess that's in the BIOS. Mind that the setting may have a different name and it could also be per controller or per port. Warning, when dual booting with Windows, preparations need to be made before changing the controller mode. See how to enable AH, AHCI in Windows 8 and Windows 10 after installation. Note, despite the terms not making any sense for NVMe, the setting is usually the same for, as for SATA. Manufacturers simply interpret SATA operation mode being set to AHCI on NVMe controllers to mean use native operating mode without firmware RAID. Okay, and this was last edited, as I mentioned, 
February 2022. Today um, is March 2022. Okay, we have covered MX Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, Manjaro, Arch. The next will be Gen 2. Okay, I'm going to read on the Gen 2 for Linux, uh, preparing the disks. And um, maybe configuring the bootloader, but probably not. I would like to keep this within about four hours. Okay, so we'll do introduction to block devices, um, designing a partition scheme, partitioning the disk with GPT for UEFI, partitioning the disk with MBR for BIOS legacy boot, creating file systems, and mounting the root partition. All right, introduction to block devices. Block devices. Let's take a good look at disk-oriented aspects of Gen 2 Linux and Linux in general, including block devices, partitions, and Linux file systems. Once the ins and outs of disks are understood, partitions and file systems can be established for installation. To begin, let's look at block devices. SCSA, SCSI, SCSI, and Serial ATA, SATA, drives are both labeled under device handles such as Dev SDA, Dev SDB, Dev SDC, etc. On more modern machines, PCI Express, that's PCIe, based NVMe solid-state disks have device handles such as Dev NVMe 0N1, Dev NVMe 0N2, etc. My next system will probably focus on that. The following table will help readers determine where to find a certain type of block device on the system. Type of device, SATA, SAS, SCSI, or USB flash. That's Dev SDA. Editorial notes and considerations. Found on hardware from roughly 2007 until present. This device handle is perhaps the most commonly used in Linux. These types of devices can be connected via the SATA bus, SCSI, USB bus as block storage. As example, the first partition on the first SATA device is called Dev SDA1. Now for NVM Express, NVME, the default, de default device handle is Dev uh, forward slash Dev forward slash NVME 0 and 1. The latest in solid state technology, NVMe drives are connected to the PCI Express bus and have the fastest transfer block speeds on the market. Systems from around 2014 and newer may have support for NVMe hardware. The first partition on the first NVMe device is called slash dev slash nvme 0 n1 p1 i'm going to assume the p1 is partition 1 type of device mmc emmc and sd that's uh the handle is slash dev slash mmc blk 0 so I guess that's MMC block zero. All right, e embedded MMC devices, SD cards, and other types of memory cards can be useful for data storage. That said, many systems may not permit booting from these types of devices. It is suggested to not use these devices for active Linux installations. 
rather consider using them to transfer files, which is their design goal. Alternatively, they could be used for short-term backups. Well, actually, if you're talking about um, those new little systems, um, the SD cards are what you actually boot from for them. Um, I forgot what they're called. Uh, hold on a second. Yeah, for example, Raspberry Pi would use those, the SD type cards. All right, the block devices above present an abstract interface to the disk. User programs can use these block devices to interact with the disk without worrying about whether the drives are SATA, SCSI, or something else. The program can simply address the storage on the disk as a bunch of contiguous, randomly accessible 4096 byte 4K blocks. Partition tables. Although it is theoretically possible to use a raw, unpartitioned disk to house a Linux system, when creating a BTRFS RAID, for example, this is almost never done in practice. Instead, disk block devices are split up into smaller, more manageable block devices. On AMD64 systems, these are called partitions. There are currently two standard partitioning technologies in use. MBR, sometimes also called DOS Disk Label, and GPT. These are tied to the two boot process types, Legacy BIOS Boot and UEFI. GUID Partition Table, that's GPT. The GUID Partition Table, GPT Setup, also called GPT Disk Label, uses 64-bit identifiers for the partitions. The location in which it stores the partition information is much bigger than the 512 bytes of the MBR partition table DOS disk label, which means there is practically no limit on the amount of partitions for a GPT disk. Also, the size of a partition is bounded by a much greater limit, almost 8 ZIB, yes, Zebby bytes. What is a Zebby byte? Give me just a second here. Okay, a Zebby byte is a unit of measurement for data storage uh, and equals 2 to the power of 70. 2 to the 70th power. So a Zebby byte is 2 to the 70th power. 8. So 8 zebabytes is 8 times 2 to the 70th power, right? Something like that. When a system's software interface between the operating system and firmware is UEFI instead of BIOS, GPT is almost mandatory as compatibility issues will arrive, arise with DOS disk label. GPT also takes advantage of checksumming and redundancy. It carries CRC32 checksums to detect errors in the header and partition tables and has a backup GPT at the end of the disk. This backup table can be used to recover damage of the primary GPT near the beginning of the disk. There are a few caveats regarding GPT. Using GPT on a BIOS-based computer works, but then one cannot dual boot with a Microsoft Windows operating system, 
which is fine with me. I am done with Windows as much as possible. The reason is that Microsoft Windows will boot in UEFI mode if it detects a GPT partition label. Some buggy old motherboard firmware configured to boot in BIOS, CSM, legacy mode might also have problems with booting from GPT labeled disks. Master Boot Record MBR or DOS Boot Sector. The Master Boot Record Boot Sector, also called DOS Boot Sector or DOS Disk Label, was first introduced in 1983 with PC-DOS 2.x. MBR uses 32-bit identifiers for the start sector and length of the partitions and supports three partition types, primary, extended, and logical. Primary partitions have their information stored in the master boot record itself a very small, usually 512 bytes, location at the very beginning of a disk. Due to this small space, only four primary partitions are supported. For instance, dev SDA1 to dev SDA4. In order to support more partitions, one of the primary partitions in the MBR can be marked as an extended partition. This partition can then contain additional logical partitions, partitions within a partition. Important, although still supported by most motherboard manufacturers, MBR boot sectors and their associated partitioning limitations are considered legacy. Unless working with hardware that is pre-2010, it this should say it is best uh, to partition a disk with GUID partition table. Readers who must proceed with setup type should knowingly acknowledge the following information. Most post-2010 motherboards consider using MBR boot sectors a legacy, supported, supported but not ideal boot mode. Due to using 32-bit identifiers, partition tables in the MBR cannot address storage space that is larger than 2 terabytes in size. Unless an extended partition is created, MBR supports a maximum of four partitions. This setup does not provide a backup boot sector, so if something overwrites the partition table, all partition information will be lost. That said, MBR and BIOS built is still frequently used in virtualized cloud environments such as AWS. What is that, Amazon Web Services? The handbook authors suggest using GPT whenever possible for Gen 2 installations. And now, advanced storage. The AMD 64 installation CD, CDs, they still call these CDs, not USBs, provide support for logical volume LVM, uh, logical volume manager. LVM increases the flexibility offered by the partitioning setup. It allows to combine partitions and disks into volume groups and define RAID groups or caches on fast SSDs for slow HDs. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, let me read that again. The AMD 64 installation C CDs provide support for logical volume manager. LVM increases the flexibility offered by the partitioning setup. It allows to combine partitions and disks into volume groups and define RAID groups or caches on fast SSDs for slow HDs. The installation instructions below will focus on regular partitions, but it is good to know 
LVM is supported if that route is desired. Visit the LVM article for more details. Newcomers beware. Although fully supported, LVM is outside the scope of this guide. Oh, outside the scope of this uh, guide. Uh, okay. Default partitioning scheme. Throughout the remainder of the handbook, we will discuss and explain two cases. One, GPT partition table and UEV FI boot. And two, <clears throat> I'm gonna. I'm not gonna read two. MBR partition table and legacy BIOS boot. So we're just gonna do one. While it is possible to mix and match, that goes beyond the scope of this manual. As already stated above, installations on modern hardware should use GPT partition table and UEFI boot as an exception from this rule. MBR and BIOS boot is still frequently used in virtualized cloud environments. The following partitioning scheme will be used as a simple example layout. SDA1 is FAT32 UEFI or EXT4 BIOS. How do I know um, which one to use though? 256M boot EFI system partition, dev SDA2 swap, RAM size times 2, swap partition, dev SDA3 EXT4 rest of disk root partition. If this suffices as information, the advanced reader can directly skip ahead to the actual partitioning. Both FDISC and parted are partitioning utilities. FDISC is well known, stable, and recommended for the MBR partition layout. Parted was one of the first Linux block device management utilities to support GPT partitions and provides an alternative. Heat alternative. Here FDISC is used since it has a better text-based user interface. Before going to the creation instructions, the first set of sections will describe in more detail how partitioning schemes can be created and mention some common pitfalls. Designing a partition scheme. How many partitions and how big? Designing a partition scheme. How many partitions and how big? The design of disk partition layout is highly dependent on the demands of the system and the file systems applied to the device. If there are lots of users, then it is advised to have a slash home on a separate partition, which will increase security and make backups and other types of maintenance easier. If Gen 2 is being installed to perform as a mail server, then slash ver should be a separate partition as all mails are stored inside the slash ver VAR directory. Game servers may have a separate slash OPT partition since most gaming server software is installed therein. The reason for these recommendations is similar to the slash home directory. Security, backups, and maintenance. In most situations on Gen 2, the user and VAR should be kept relatively large in size. User hosts the majority of applications available on the system and the Linux kernel sources under user SRC, USR slash SRC. By default, VAR hosts the Gen 2 
eBuild repository located at slash ver slash db slash repos slash gentoo, which, depending on the file system, generally consumes around 650 megabytes of disk space. This space estimate excludes the slash ver slash cache slash dist files and slash ver slash cache bin packages directories, which will gradually fill with source files and optionally binary packages respectively as they are added to the system. How many partitions and how big very much depends on considering the trade-offs and choosing the best option for the circumstance. Separate partitions or volumes have the following advantages. Choose the best performing file system for each partition or volume. The entire system cannot run out of free space if one defunct tool is continuously writing files to a partition or volume. If necessary, file system checks are reduced in time, as multiple checks can be done in parallel. Although this advantage is realized more with multiple disks than it is with multiple partitions. Security can be enhanced by mounting some partitions or volumes read-only. NOSUID SETUID bits are ignored. NOEXEC Executable bits are ignored, etc. However, multiple partitions have certain advantages as well. However, multiple partitions have certain disadvantages of, as well. If not configured properly, the system might have lots of free space on one partition and little free space on another. A separate partition for USR may require the administrator to boot with an initra MFS to mount the partition before other boot scripts start. Since the generation and maintenance of an Initra MFS is beyond the scope of this handbook, we recommend that newcomers do not use a separate partition for USR. There is also a 15 partition limit for SCSI and SATA unless the disk uses GPT labels. If you intend to, now that says uses, but it should say if you intend to use system D, USR must be available on boot, either as part of the root file system or mounted via an Initra MFS. What about swap space? There is no perfect value for swap space size. The purpose of the space is to provide disk storage to the kernel when internal memory RAM is under pressure. A swap, a swap space allows for the kernel to move memory pages that are not likely to be accessed soon to disk, swap or page out, which will free memory in RAM for the current task. Of course, if the pages swapped to disk are suddenly needed, they will need to be put back in memory, page in, which will take considerably longer than reading from RAM, as disks are very slow compared to internal memory. When a system is not going to run memory-intensive applications or has lots of RAM available, then it probably does not need much swap space. However, do note, in case of hibernation, that swap space is used to store the entire contents of memory, likely on desktop and laptop systems 
rather than on server systems. If the system requires support for hibernation, then swap space larger than or equal to the amount of memory is necessary. As a general rule, the swap space size is recommended to be twice the internal memory RAM. For systems with multiple hard disks, it is wise to create one swap partition on each disk so that they can be utilized for parallel read-write operations. The faster a disk can swap, the faster the system will run when data in swap space must be accessed. When choosing between rotational and solid-state disks, it is better for performance to put swap on the SSD. Also, swap files can be used as an alternative to swap partitions. This is mostly interesting for systems with very limited disk space. What is the EFI system partition, ESP? When installing Gen 2 on a system that uses UEFI to boot, the operating system instead of BIOS, then it is important that an EFI system partition, ESP, is created. The instructions below contain the necessary pointers to correctly handle this operation. The EFI system partition is not required when booting in BIOS legacy mode. The ESP must be a FAT variant, sometimes shown as VFAT on Linux systems. The official UEFI specification denotes FAT 12, 16, or 32 file systems will be recognized by the UEFI firmware, although FAT32 is recommended for the ESP. After partitioning, format the ESP accordingly. What is that? MKFS.FAT-F32-DEVSDA1. If the ESP is not formatted with a FAT variant, the system's UEFI firmware will not find the bootloader or a Linux kernel, and will most likely be unable to boot the system. What is the BIOS boot partition? A BIOS boot partition is only needed when combining a GPT partition layout with GRUB2 in BIOS legacy mode. It is not required when booting in EFI, UEFI mode and also not required when using an MBR table. It is a very small 1 to 2 megabyte partition in which bootloaders like Grub2 can put additional data that doesn't fit in the allocated storage. It will not be used in this guide. Partitioning the disk with GPT for UEFI. The following parts explain how to create the example partition layout. Sorry about the noise in the background. You see how many hours this is. So, the following parts explain how to create the example partition layout for a GPT UEFI boot installation using FDisk. The example partition layout was mentioned earlier. SDA1 was the EFI system and boot partition, SDA2 swap partition, SDA3 root partition. Change the partition layout according to personal preference. Viewing the current partition layout, FDisk is a popular and powerful tool, tool to split a disk into partitions. Fire up FDisk. Against the disk, in our example, we use dev SDA, fdisk slash dev slash SDA. Use the P key to display the disk's current partition configuration, P. This particular disk was configured to house two Linux file systems. 
each with a corresponding partition listed as Lennox, as well as a swap partition listed as Lennox swap. Excuse me. Creating a new disk label slash removing all par partitions. Type G to create a new GPT disk label on the disk. This will remove all existing partitions. Created a new GPT disk label. For an existing GPT disk label, see the output of P above. Alternatively, consider removing the existing partitions one by one from the disk. Type D to delete a partition. For instance, to delete an existing slash dev slash SDA1 uh, command, you use D, and then you give the partition number 1. The partition has now been scheduled for deletion. It will no longer show up when printing the list of partitions, P, but it will not be erased until the changes have been saved. This allows users to abort the operation if a mistake was made. In that case, type Q immediately and hit enter, and the partition will not be deleted. Repeatedly type P to print out partition listing, and then type D and the number of the partition to delete it. Eventually, the partition table will be empty. Now that the in-memory partition table is empty, we're ready to create partitions. Creating the EFI system partition, ESP. First create a small, excuse me, a small EFI system partition, which will also be mounted as slash boot. Type N to create a new partition filed by one to select the first partition. When prompted for the first sector, make sure it starts from 2048, which may, may be needed for the bootloader, and hit enter. When prompted for the last sector, type plus 256M to create a partition 256 megabytes in size. And partition one. Okay. Mark the partition as EFI system partition. So T, partition one, partition type L to list all types, changed type of partition, Linux file system to EFI system. Creating the swap partition. Next, to create the swap partition, type N to create a new partition. Then type 2 to create the second partition. Dev SDA2, when prompted for the first sector, hit enter. When prompted for the last sector, type plus 4G, or any other size needed for the swap space, to create a partition 4 gigabytes in size. So it's plus whatever the number of gigabytes with a capital G. All right, command N. I guess that's new partition. After all this is done, type T to set the partition type. Two to select the partition just created. Um, was that partition two? Yes. And then type in 19 to set the partition type to Linux swap. Creating the root partition. Finally, to create the root partition, type N to create a new partition. Then type 3 to create the third partition, slash, slash dev slash SDA3. When prompted for the first sector, hit enter. When prompted for the last sector, hit enter, to create a partition that takes up the rest of the remaining space on the disk. After completing these steps, typing P should display a partition table that looks similar to this. Saving the partition layout. 
To save the partition layout and exit FDisk, type W. With the partitions created, it is now time to put file systems on them. Partitioning the disk with MBR for BIOS. Oh, okay. So we're not reading the MBR legacy boot section for this. All right, the last section now, we've done MX Linux, Debian, Ubuntu, Manjaro, Arch, Gentoo. Now we're going to do LFS. That's Linux from scratch under Chapter 2, uh, Preparing the Host System, 2.4, Creating a New Partition. Now, uh, before I read this, Notice, um, let me see if I can go to home. This is version 11.1, .1, published March 1st, 2022. So it's current. All right, 2.4, creating a new partition. Like most other operating systems, LFS is usually installed on a dedicated partition. The recommended approach to building an LFS system is to use an available empty partition or if you have enough unpartitioned space to create one. A minimal system requires a partition of around 10 gigabytes, GB. This is enough to store all the source tarballs, tarballs and compile the packages. However, if the LFS system is intended to be the primary Linux system. Excuse me. Additional software will, will probably be installed, which will require additional space. A 30 gigabyte partition is a reasonable size to provide for growth. The LFS system itself will not take up this much room. A large portion of this requirement is to provide sufficient free temporary storage as well as for adding additional capabilities after LFS is complete. Additionally, compiling packages can require a lot of disk space which will be reclaimed after the package is installed. Because there is not always enough random access memory, RAM, available for compilation processes. It is a good idea to use a small disk partition as swap space. This is used by the kernel to store seldom used data and leave more memory available for active processes. The swap partition for an LFS system can be the same as the one used by the host system, in which case it is not necessary to create another one. Start a disk partitioning program such as CFDisk or FDisk with a command line option naming the hard disk on which the new partition will be created. For example, dev SDA for the primary disk drive. Create a Linux native partition and a swap partition if needed. Please refer to CFDisk or FDisk if you do not yet know how to use the programs. Note, for experienced users, other partitioning schemes are possible. The new LFS system can be on a software RAID array or an LVM logical volume. However, some of these options require an Initra MFS, which is an advanced topic. Okay, that's under um, the BLFS section for the LVM, and the Initra MFS is on BLFS also. I don't know if I'll read those. These partitioning methodologies are not recommended for first-time LFS users. Oh, okay. Other partition issues. Requests for advice on system partitioning 
are often posted on the LFS mailing list. This is a highly subjective topic. The default for most distributions is to use the entire drive with the exception of one small swap partition. This is not optimal for LFS for several reasons. It reduces flexibility, makes sharing of data across multiple distributions or LFS builds more difficult, makes backups more time consuming, and can waste disk space through inefficient allocation of file system structures. The root partition. A root LFS partition, not to be confused with the slash root directory, of 20 gigabytes is a good compromise for most systems. It provides enough space to build LFS and most of BLFS, but is small enough so that multiple partitions can be easily created for experimentation. The swap partition. Most distributions automatically create a swap partition. Generally, the recommended size of the swap partition is about twice the amount of physical RAM. However, this is rare, rarely needed. If disk space is limited, hold the swap partition to 2 gigabytes and monitor the amount of disk, sw disk swapping. If you want to use the hibernation feature, suspend a disk of Linux, it writes out the contents of RAM to the swap partition before turning off the machine. In this case, the size of the swap partition should be at least as large as the system's installed RAM. Swapping is never good. For mechanical hard drives, you can generally tell if a system is swapping by just listening to disk activity and observing how the system reacts to commands. For an SSD drive, you will not be able to hear swapping, but you can tell how much swap space is being used by the top or free programs. Use an SSD drive for a swap partition uh, to, should be avoided if possible. The first reaction to swapping should be to check for an unreasonable command, such as trying to edit a 5 gigabyte file. If swapping becomes a normal occurrence, the best solution is to purchase more RAM for your system. The Grub BIOS Partition If the boot disk has been partitioned with a GUID partition table, GPT, then a small, typically 1 megabyte partition must be created if it does not already exist. This partition is not formatted but must be available for Grub to use during installation of the bootloader. This partition will normally be labeled BIOS boot. If using FDisk or have a code of EF02, if using GDisk. Note, the Grub BIOS partition must be on the drive that the BIOS uses to boot the system. This is not necessarily the same drive where the LFS root partition is located. Disks on a system may use different partition table types. The requirement for this partition depends only on the partition table type of the boot disk. Convenience partitions. There are several other partitions that are not required but should be considered when designing a disk layout. The following list is not comprehensive, but is meant as a guide. Slash boot, highly recommended. Use this partition to store kernels and other booting information. To minimize potential boot problems with larger disks, make this the first physical partition on your first disk drive. A partition size of 200 megabytes is quite adequate. Slash home, highly recommended. Share your home directory and user customization 
across multiple distributions or LFS builds. The size is generally fairly large and de depends on available disk space. Slash user. In LFS, slash bin, slash lib, and slash sbin are sim links to their counterpart in slash usr. So user contains all binaries needed for the system to run. For LFS, a separate partition for user is normally not needed. If you need it anyway, you should make a partition large enough to fit all programs and libraries in the system. The root partition can be very small, maybe just one gigabyte. In this configuration, so it's suitable for a thin client or diskless workstation where USR is mounted from a remote server. However, you should take care that an Initra MFS not covered by LFS will be needed to boot a system with a separate USR partition. OPT. This directory is most useful for BLFS where multiple installations of large packages like GNOME or KDE can be installed with, um, without embedding the files in the USR hierarchy. If used, 5 to 10 gigabytes is generally adequate. TMP. A separate TMP directory is rare but useful if configuring a thin client. This partition, if used, will usually not need to exceed a couple of gigabytes. Slash USR slash SRC. This partition is very useful for providing a location to store BLFS source files and share them across LFS builds. It can also be used as a location for building BLFS packages. A reasonably large partition of 30 to 50 gigabytes allows plenty of room. Any separate partition that you want automatically mounted upon boot needs to be specified in the ETC FS tab. Details about how to specify partitions will be discussed in section 10.2 creating the etc fstab file. And that uh, concludes the reading. I will put a buy me a coffee link underneath the video if you appreciate the work and time uh, I put into this. Uh, go ahead and uh, buy me a coffee. Thank you for listening and I hope this was useful to you.